Do you, do you have somebody on your team doing, um, you know, doing analysis of the microbiome post? Have you, I mean, is that something you guys have explored so far at this point? We will in our next clinical trial. We'll do uh, full DNA sequencing baseline and follow up to see what what shifts occur because there probably are. That may give us a hint what that community looks like. Maybe it needs uh, a specific proportion of fecalobacterium or lactospiracy or some other. I just don't know. We haven't done that yet. Are you familiar with Dr. Sabine Hazen off on the in the west? She's on the west coast, but she's oh, a she the one doing a lot of the fecal transplants. She does fecal transplants, but they have a research facility as well. They're they're the ones that found out during COVID. She could, she took a lot of flack for this. That the people post uh, post jabby jab got um, a decimation of bifidobacteria, and that and that that was what she suspected was part of the problem. And that by giving high dose vitamin C, you saw a return. Hmm. of bifidobacter species and so they were testing that pre-post she was running samples on people but I, I just thought if you if you if you have somebody on your team great but if you didn't she might be a good introduction to make to you if you don't know her to um because she's got a lab and this might be a topic that um that she could help you with as well oh great thought i hadn't heard that with the vitamin c uh, we have heard we have seen the taiwan data that showed that with COVID, not the uh, vaccine, with COVID itself, there's a depletion of bifidobacteria species. And we've had some good success in the long COVID people, uh, having them get uh, bifidobacteria, either probiotics and or uh, yogurts. Bifidobacteria also make good yogurts. Yeah. So how are you making your yogurts? What What's your base ingredients? Walk, walk, walk us through, you know, the person watching this, if they want to use your root or eye and make some yogurt, how do they do? How do they go about that? So you'll need the microbe. So I, I, I formulate those products in part to provide the microbe to people, the myroideri or the gut to glow, either can be used. Uh, and so you need a minimum of 2 billion to start. So you'll have more than enough of any of those things. So 2 billion microbes, put it in a bowl. I like to add prebiotic fiber. It's kind of like adding cow manure to your vegetable garden. You're going to have bigger tomatoes and cucumbers. So I uh, add a tablespoon of a prebiotic fiber like inulin, which is very easy to get. Uh, we make a slurry, add a couple tablespoons. I use half and half organic, half and half, because I reject this whole idea of cutting fat and cholesterol. So add a little bit of the half and half, stir it, make sure all the clumps are broken up, then top it off with the rest of the half and half, cover it, and then keep it at human body temperature, around 98 to 100 degrees thereabouts, in your sous vide, in your yogurt maker, in your instant pot, or whatever device you have, for 36 hours, covered. And after 36 hours, you got this super duper rich, thick yogurt. Now, sometimes the first batch likes to separate, and it's the subsequent batch is made from a little of the prior batch. It's kind of like having a garden. If I give you a tomato and you plant tomatoes, those seeds to make tomatoes, at the end of the season, you save a tomato for the seeds for next year. Same thing here. We make a batch, save a little of the this batch to use to, for, the prior, for the next batch. A couple of tablespoons is all you need to get started for the next batch. So you, you'll have to purchase the microbes once, never have to purchase them again. And this is true for most lactobacillus species, mo most bifidobacteria species, you can, there's some other species you can ferment also. The only thing to know about, it helped, if, if your listeners get into the whole world of, of fermenting things, it helps to understand microbes and have them fall in two different categories. Human body temperature fermenting microbes, like lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. Then there's room temperature fermenting microbes. Those are the species that ferment cabbage, kimchi, sauerkraut, fermented veggies. Those are different species. Leuconostoc, Wisella, Pediococcus. Very different, but still, by the way, very beneficial, extremely beneficial to have those fermented foods. But those can be fermented at room temperature, typically. Okay. So you use a, you just use a half and half, organic half and half, and add a couple billion, two billion, and then it's a 36-hour wait. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. uh, now, if there, there's some variation with some microbes, 
uh, like, for instance, uh, there can be like Lactobacillus plantarum, which is a very versatile species. You can get by with 90 degrees at 24 hours. So I, I, I do, it, people don't want to look through the microbiological literature to figure this out. So I put it in the super gut book, like a recipe book. What I did there was I said things like this. If you want better skin, uh, better well-being, uh, ferment Lactobacillus ruteri. If you want a smaller waist, ferment Lactobacillus gasseri. If you want to recover from strenuous exercise because you're a competitive athlete or you have hard physical labor, let's ferment Bacillus coagulans. If you want a healthier baby who benefits more from human breast milk, let's ferment, make sure that child has Bifidobacter infantis. If you are a woman who's struggling with urinary tract infections and, and, and incontinence, vag, vaginal infections, let's ferment Lactobacillus crispatus. In other words, you can pick and choose at least until we get a better way to restore everything that's missing. Until that happens, we kind of pick and choose the microbes we want for the effect we want. Gotcha, gotcha. What's your advice on, you, you know, let's just take take somebody who's just trying to maintain a really good healthy microbiome and, and i know you you're famous for i think most famous for your book wheat belly um but what's your just general guidance or advice for someone who we want to maintain a good healthy microbiome and um whether we're adding you know l ruteri or gas rye or bacillus or whatever it might be how do we avoid that as we walk through life what are your top tips to avoid like detriment to your to your microbiome you know beyond the obvious you mentioned chlorine and fluoride in the water you mentioned you know antibiotic use are there other things that that you would guide people to say hey preserve your microbiome by doing these things you know we have to kind of go back to real foods that don't have preservatives emulsifying agents uh, other additives, because those are all disruptive on the gastrointestinal microbiome. So people don't have to remember that you should avoid polysorbate 80, for instance, in ice cream. But go back to foods that don't have labels. Go back to foods that don't have risk of additives. An avocado, uh, pork, <laughs> um, foods that are as close to their basic form as possible. Once you allow a manufacturer to add stuff, it could be carboxymethylcellulose, could be BHT. Uh, rather than memorize that list, we go back to just whole real foods, organic, of course, whenever possible, minus herbicides and pesticides. The other thing is, is lots and lots of fermented foods. The, the, the interesting thing about fermented foods, so let's say you have some kimchi or sauerkraut, or maybe you fermented some uh, cherry tomatoes and garlic and eggplant on your kitchen counter. So easy. Uh, you can either use, by the way, uh, microbes resident on the surface of that vegetable, uh, but it's much easier to use a starter culture. Here, here's an easy workaround. Buy or obtain some, uh, yo uh, some sauerkraut or other fermented food. Take some of the brine. It's like fermented pickles from the store. Make sure it's fermented, of course. Take some of the brine, add that to your chopped veggies immersed in saline, it has to be salt water, uh, filtered water, no chlorine, and non-iodized salt also. So uh, pour that brine from that commercial product into your mixture of fermented veggies and let them ferment on your kitchen counter for days to weeks. And so it's very inexpensive. But this, the crazy thing about fermented foods is the species of fermented foods like the ones I mentioned, Leuconostoc mesenteroides or Pediococcus pentaceous. No, no one has to remember that. <laughs> uh, those microbes don't take up residence in the human GI tract. You consume them, say, as sauerkraut, they pass right through you. But they provide benefit in that they, they feed beneficial microbes and cause them to proliferate. So you'll get more lactobacillus species, you'll get more acromantia, more fecalobacterium, all the beneficial species that have all kinds of wonderful effects. So even so fermented foods are extremely important, even though they themselves don't take up residence. Those microbes don't take up residence. They they feed. They're kind of like farmers. They they, they cultivate things for you. Interesting. So not even necessarily trying to, to populate your gut, just trying to get the benefits of the bacteria and the food that nourish the gut and, and keep what's supposed to be there healthier overall.